Hello and welcome to this lecture on the subject of the Morecambe Bay Barrage. I'm David Ball, the chairman of the Power Industries Division Northwest Centre of the IMAC -E, and I would like to thank you all for joining our webinar lecture today. Before we get started, I would like to say a big thank you to Emma Tateson, the senior events executive from the IMAC -E headquarters for helping to set up this session. It has been organized by the Power Industries Division, Northwest Center of the IMAC -E, and it is shared with the Greater Manchester area of the IMAC -E. The duration of the lecture will be 40 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions. You can type your questions in the question and answer box, and Murat Islam, the social media secretary of the Northwest region of the IMAC -E, will endeavour to facilitate them after the lecture. For more detailed answers, please contact Emma Pateman at the IMAC -E, and she will seek answers from the speaker and advise you by email. The lecture will be recorded and the video will be made available later. The presentation will explain the history of the project and refer to the numerous unsuccessful attempts to capture the tidal energy of Morecambe Bay. In the latest proposal, there is another dimension, and that is the expected rise in sea level of at least one metre by the end of the century. The latest proposal will also include a road linking Haysham with Barrow. The speaker is Professor George Agidas from the University of Lancaster, who has been involved with the Morecambe Bay Barrage considerations for some time, together with other tidal projects. He is very passionate about the Morecambe Bay project and is hopeful that it will go ahead on this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for this evening, Professor George Agidas. Thank you. Uh, David, thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, kind introduction. Uh, I will be covering uh, today uh, on the subject of uh, Mokan Bay Tidal Barras. That is the title that uh, uh, the Amaki has asked me to uh, talk to you about today. Uh, and I'll cover an introduction, a resource, and look in the past, present, and future, the next steps, and then I will draw some conclusions. And uh, let's start with uh, an introduction. Here on, uh, uh, this, on the figure, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see Morecambe Bay. Uh, and uh, uh, on uh, the left-hand side, you can see the Hessian port, and on uh, the far right top, you can see Barrow and uh, Walney Island. And somewhere on the left here, you could also see Lancaster University. Uh, where we are today, let's uh, look at uh, the politics of uh, the last uh, three weeks and uh, looking at uh, UK energy and environment. And uh, really, is our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, turning green? Now, on the 30th of uh, September this year, uh, Boris Johnson at the UN summit in, uh, on uh, biodiversity said that uh, nearly a third of UK land would be protected for nature. Britain today is also uh, world leading on offshore wind. Uh, we do have uh, here in Britain uh, the largest offshore wind farms. Uh, uh, and here you can see uh, batteries in Scotland, 588 megawatts, that uh, could uh, power uh, 450,000 properties. So uh, Boris, Boris Johnson, on uh, is uh, in on the news uh, in uh, October 2020 over the last uh, couple of weeks 
saying that offshore wind farms will produce enough electricity to power all UK homes within a decade. Uh, this is a big task, not impossible, but a big challenge, uh, because uh, delivering up to 40 gigawatts of power on the grid by 2030, it will require action in this parliament. And the question now is to find the right catalyst for our Prime Minister to put uh, finance and targets to these ideas. On the 6th of October, I noticed that uh, the BHA website, the British Hydropower Association, that uh, has developed uh, uh, the Tidal Rage Alliance, and uh, the first chairman is Henry Dixon, since uh, January 2020. Uh, saying that uh, for firm power, we need to look no further than our coast. The UK is blessed with some of the world's best tidal range resources. Tidal range projects with barrages and impoundments proposed along much of the UK's west coast would deliver today reliable, industrial scale, low carbon power generation and help maintain grid security and stability and protect coastal communities from storm surges and rising sea levels and provide thousands of jobs in places where employment is hard to find. And obviously with an operating life of over 120 years, at least double that of a nuclear power plant and three to four times the life of wind and solar farms, and many whole system benefits, tidal range energy generation is cost competitive and should have a significant role to play in the UK's green recovery. That's 6th of October. Now, uh, on the 8th of October, uh, His Royal Highness Prince William said that he aimed to take the environmental button from his father, Prince Charles. But of course, Prince Charles took that button from uh, his father, Prince Philip. And uh, here I'm talking with uh, Prince Philip. Uh, and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh has been a great supporter of the environment and nature conservation. And of course, Prince Charles, and here I'm talking to him, to Prince Charles, uh, discussing renewables and sustainability. So, on the 8th of October, 2020, Prince William and Sir David Attenborough uh, joined forces and launched uh, the Earthshot Prize. This is a Nobel Prize for environmentalists. And uh, Prince William said, I think the dotty person now would be the person who doesn't believe in climate change. So the prize is looking for brilliant projects to solve the planet. And the search is for 50 solutions in the world's largest environmental problems by 2030. So this uh, 50 projects, the Earthshot Prize, is the biggest environmental prize ever. And they intend to be used to protect for projects to protect and restore nature, clean our air, revive our oceans, build a waste-free world, and fix our climate. And now I'm going to talk to you about my vision, how we can move forward. This year, we have seen a pandemic that sweep across the globe and turning our life as we know it upside down. 
It has shown us that we are one global community and that we need to cooperate in order to solve global problems. As with the climate emergency, coronavirus has affected the most vulnerable people in our society. Exposed the serious weaknesses of our current systems in place. So we need, as we look towards the future, we need to rebuild the society with sustainable Greek green jobs at the heart. A society that puts an end to fuel poverty and the misery of cold, expensive to heat homes. And a society that safeguards our planet and the health of everything living on it. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the Mokan Bay Tidal Barrage and how this project is a vital step in getting us closer to a greener, safer, and fairer future. But let's begin back at Lancaster University. This is where the team is, and this is where uh, all the work and the research is taking place. You can see the engineering building on the photo of uh, Lancaster University where the team is based and uh, works. We are involved with uh, research on renewable energy and fluid machinery, both generic and applied. Uh, we do research on any energy aspect, including renewables, look into computational and experimental modeling, device development, power takeoffs, computational fluid dynamics and control, economics, resource and condition monitoring. Also, we look into novel topology of fluid machinery and turbines. We carry out a computational fluid dynamics on turbine design and analysis, direct drive and inline turbines. Uh, I'll talk about siphonic low head and low cost hydropower and fluid machinery reliability and energy efficiency. And we are funded by EPSRC, Carbon Trust, the European Union, RDAs, utilities, and industry. We have state-of-the-art facilities. So for waves, we have a state-of-the-art uh, wave testing facility where we carry out uh, 100 scale uh, testing for new wave energy devices. And also it has a moving floor that uh, and uh, thrusters that uh, we can generate uh, tides and we can test uh, tidal energy devices or combination of waves and tides. Also, we have uh, quite unique uh, novel topology turbines testing facilities. Just to give you a couple examples of these facilities, here uh, you can see the Lancaster University uh, solution to a problem that they have in Holland, the government of Holland in the 60s because of flooding created uh, uh, estuaries, the dikes, that uh, uh, 60 years later present an environmental disaster because uh, stagnant water could uh, start, uh, could kill fish, plants, could affect tourism because uh, of uh, smelling water, stagnant water. And they want to solve the problem with en today's environmentally friendly solution. And a friendly solution using the tides in uh, uh, Holland could include uh, the siphonic hydro that you can see on the picture here, and we carry out tests. And as a byproduct of that, we could also uh, generate energy uh, using air turbine. And this is very friendly and fish friendly solution that will not uh, cause any problems uh, in, uh, to the future generations. 
And at the same time, uh, we are having, uh, we are carrying out research at Lancaster University on low head hydro and Archimedes screw turbines for tidal applications. Uh, projects could easily be this uh, tidal bridge idea in Indonesia, uh, where uh, even uh, very large uh, fish and uh, can actually pass through at uh, very slow running uh, turbines, and it's an environmentally friendly solution for tidal projects. And here uh, you can see some of uh, the technical work we have done and the outputs are available on the public domain. We are also carrying out a lot of uh, wave energy research at uh, Lancaster University uh, for a number of years now. Just to give you a couple examples, one with industry and one generic. Uh, with industry, at the moment, we carry out uh, the project of uh, waves to watch. Uh, this is uh, a multi-oscillating water column wave energy converter and uh, is combined with a floating breakwater. Every port in the world needs uh, uh, breakwater combined with uh, wave energy. Uh, we can use... Uh, a the force of the water to produce energy rather than just have uh, a reinforced concrete to absorb uh, the force of uh, the waves. And our generic work that uh, has uh, begun from uh, the Super Gemarine Phase 1, Phase 2, Phase 3 and continues uh, on multi axis wave energy converters like this Talos. And you can see Talos 1, Talos 2, and now. Uh, uh, next year, we are progressing with a new project, uh, Talos 3. On uh, ocean currents and range, we carry out significant research. Uh, I'll give you some examples here. Currently, uh, we are carrying out research with uh, Infinitis Global on uh, tidal current uh, turbines uh, coupled with uh, hydrogen storage technology. And uh, we have been working for a number of years with uh, Andrich Hydro and uh, G. Alstom on uh, uh, tidal range projects. And uh, with uh, the Norwegian company Tidec, we look into smart sea water storage to provide flexibility services uh, to the energy network. And here are some papers available in the public domain. We also carry out a lot of work on uh, uh, modeling and low head hydro. Here is an example, uh, not far away from Lancaster University. This is uh, a Hironcom mill on the River Bila. Uh, this is a uh, Hironcom mill uh, before the installation of uh, uh, the plant. And uh, going through the project, you can see uh, a completed project with a Kaplan turbine, 120 kilowatts, uh, uh, producing electricity uh, during the course of this uh, project. Uh, looking at uh, the resource, it's all about the, intera the gravitational interaction between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun that create the natural ebb and flow of the coastal tidal waters. And as engineers, we translate that in two forms. One is kinetic energy. So we take the flows due to blood, uh, flood and ebb currents and use tidal current turbines to that look like uh, wind turbines, but obviously they are smaller for the same output 
uh, but uh, uh, built in a stronger way because uh, the water density is about 800 times higher than the air density. And the second is potential energy. We take advantage of the rise and fall of the tides that could easily be up to 16 meters. And here on the right, you can see in Canada, Nova Scotia, uh, at uh, the Bay of Fungi, and uh, the, the highest range on the world, uh, the minus basin, 16.2 meters. Uh, the second largest is uh, here in the UK, at the seven. Uh, and this is why uh, there is such a great interest on tidal range projects on the west coast of uh, uh, the UK, in, uh, on the seven, and also where uh, Lancaster is situated on the northwest. Uh, you can see here the global distribution of tidal rains uh, and uh, why uh, there is such a great interest on uh, the British Isles. And uh, focusing on uh, the UK tidal resource, we can see on the left-hand left side the resource for tidal stream. And you can see that there is an interest on the seven uh, and uh, Anglesey and further up on uh, uh, top of Scotland. Uh, while on tidal range, you can see the potential being predominantly on the west coast of the UK. Uh, and uh, the, it could, it's split, let's say, roughly 50% on the seven and 50% on the northwest coast, uh, from North Wales up to Solway in Scotland, with Lancaster right in the middle of this activity. And uh, these are the hotspots around the world. Obviously, uh, you can see that India, China, Korea, Russia, Australia, obviously Alaska. I, I mentioned about uh, uh, Canada and the Annapolis project there, Bay Fundi, uh, below California, in Mexico, Central America, and then further down on the two sides of uh, uh, Latin America, on Argentina and uh, Chile. And obviously, you can see the focus on uh, the UK. Uh, as I said, predominantly on the West Coast, uh, with uh, less uh, on uh, the remaining of uh, the UK. And uh, here is one uh, recent uh, uh, paper available in the public domain that gives even more information on uh, uh, tidal resource. Uh, as an overview, looking into the past, uh, and uh, Mokan Bay proposals from uh, the past up to now, we can see that back in uh, George Stevenson, back in 1837, made one of the proposals for the West Coast uh, Railway to go on a bridge of uh, uh, Mokan Bay. In 1857, the Lancaster to Grange of the Sands railway bridge across Mokan Bay became a reality. In the 60s, Ernest Liming, uh, till his death, uh, was uh, uh, making a lot of proposals for a barrage for Mokan Bay. In 2002, a Kendall local engineer uh, made a proposal for a tidal barrage and uh, uh, a lot of uh, activities. Uh, on uh, the local newspaper 
the Westmoreland Gazette. And then in 2004, when I joined Lagasse University, uh, I uh, worked with uh, David Brockman and Martin Whedon, uh, looking into tidal fences and the blue energy from Canada. Also, I worked with uh, David Brockman and uh, Stephen Solder, Professor Stephen Solder from Edinburgh University, uh, and uh, to develop uh, an idea of uh, theta islands. And there is a, a paper available on that. And finally, uh, with uh, David Brockman and myself, uh, we went to Norway. Uh, we visited the water power industries and uh, we came with, uh, forward with the idea of a bridge across the bay using uh, tidal uh, current uh, turbines. In uh, 2008, uh, we launched the Northwest Tidal Energy Group and I became the, its founding chairman. Uh, in uh, 2010, Nigel Caderson uh, joined forces uh, with Peter Roberts and made the proposal for a Mocha Bay barrage uh, using VET technology. Then uh, in uh, 2014, the late Alan Tovel, uh, myself and uh, the Northwest uh, business leaders uh, team proposed that the, the Liverpool exhibition, the Northwest Energy Square model for Mocan Bay. In 2015, uh, Mokeli, uh, a Lancaster based uh, architect, made a proposal for a barrage and uh, created the Northwest Tidal Energy Alliance. And uh, uh, Surprising for an engineer like myself, in 2018, I became an advisor for a theatrical play, uh, keeping the lights on on Mokan Bay. And also it included Mokan Bay Tidal Barras that I advised for. And uh, I even attended this play at uh, a theatrical play at the Duke Theatre at Lancaster. Uh, looking at uh, global references around the world, we can see that uh, uh, we start in the 60s with uh, Laurence, uh, that it's still operational and is ex a, gre a great example for all of us to follow. Uh, the Russians uh, with uh, Kislaya Guba uh, came up with uh, uh, some smaller project. In the 80s, uh, uh, the Canadians at, uh, they created the Annapolis project, uh, the Bay of Fundi, uh, with uh, an Andrich Vatek hydro turbine, just a single turbine producing 20 megawatts, still operational. And uh, the Chinese came with a series of uh, much smaller uh, projects. And uh, today, the latest and largest newest in the world is the Siwa project in South Korea, connected to the grid in 2011. Uh, here you can see uh, the project that uh, Lancaster University has been cl very close to it, uh, all through the stages of its uh, development. And uh, here, I'm uh, with, on a picture with uh, Markus Schneeberger, uh, the global vice president of uh, uh, Andritz uh, Hydro for Engineering that has been in charge of this project. Looking at the present, uh, today we have uh, available at our, for, uh, at our arsenal a series of technologies, starting from the left with uh, bold Kaplan turbines uh, that uh, operate high efficiency, operates up to the mid 90s, all the way up to the right, uh, open flow tidal current tidal stream turbines, uh, obviously restricted by the batch limit, and uh, they can 
operate perhaps around 47% efficiency, and a series of other ideas like the Rolls-Royce contra-rotating idea that I have uh, in uh, uh, the middle. Lancaster University has been uh, carrying out a lot of research on uh, uh, multifunctional infrastructures together with power generation. So we're looking to power generation and uh, obviously linking it with flood risk, transport, tourism, job creation, water, cultural, heritage, fisheries, land use, habitat and species. In uh, 2017, uh, Andris Hydro and uh, G Power, uh, as part of the work uh, that was carrying out uh, for the Swansea Bay Lagoon, uh, came up with uh, an idea uh, of uh, triple regulation. It's something that uh, Lancaster University has been very closely involved, uh, and uh, we were able to using triple regulation on turbines to increase significantly the annual generated uh, power, which translates for a developer to the significant increase of annual generated revenue. And uh, here you can see uh, the turbine uh, being made at Lancaster University uh, 3D printing facilities. Uh, and there it is, uh, 3D printed on a multicolor printer we have available. And uh, here uh, we're just looking at this uh, uh, triple regulation turbine uh, with uh, Bert Hinderlang, the global vice president of Andrich Hydro for sales and marketing. Uh, in 2017, again, uh, we were looking into uh, the turbine itself and how we can benefit Britain most uh, by increasing the parts of this turbine uh, made here in the UK. This was again part of uh, the Andrich Hydro G Power. Alliance for the Tidal Lagoon project. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of discussions with uh, uh, the British government. Here I am with uh, Bert Hidan and the, the late John Epps uh, on the top, and with uh, Bert Hiderlang, the global uh, vice president of Andrich Hydro uh, for sales and marketing. Uh, at uh, the House of Parliament uh, discussing with MPs and uh, came up with uh, an idea. Uh, I remember when I was uh, at uh, the plant in Germany at Ravensburg, uh, Bernd uh, Hiddelang's team were actually looking at an exploded version of the turbine and uh, trying to put as many uh, British flags as possible uh, to make it interesting for uh, in and creating industrial opportunities here in the UK. And uh, the late Alan Torvel has been an excellent student of Lancaster University, has progressed with his NTPG, Mockham and Dayton barrages and uh, that uh, included uh, aspects in, like uh, a road uh, to connect uh, Hesham with uh, uh, Barrow across the Mokam Bay. So to summarize, historically and up to date, all the proposals uh, put forward for uh, schemes for the Morgan Bay uh, have not progressed. And this is despite greater power output forecasts because 
up to now we're predominantly using zero demodeling and technological developments on turbines, multifunctional infrastructure, and strong transport links. And this is because they have not been able to achieve appropriate financial targets for government funding and the profit to cost ratio required to attract investors. And from now on, and if we look into the future, we have to take into consideration also the climate emergency that the government has uh, signed for and also to include potential sea level rising. So looking into the next steps, the government uh, by law has uh, signed up the net zero by 2050, announced the climate emergency and put targets to decarbonize uh, the UK by 2050. Obviously, this should really take place sooner than 2050 because we already see the catastrophic effects of climate breakdown both across the globe and also here in the UK. And we have a very short window of opportunity left to avoid irreversible damage. We all need to live greener and more sustainable lives. We need to reduce the UK dependence on imports of dirty fluid, fuels like coal, oil and gas. So the UK should be powered by a homegrown renewable sector that provides jobs, clean energy at affordable prices for homes, heating, transport and industry. Uh, in uh, November 2019, the IMAKI produced a very interesting report, Rising Seas, the Engineering Challenge. Uh, and what it says, in conclusion, is prepare for a minimum of one meter rise in seas, in sea level, this century, but plan for three meters of sea rise. And definitely, uh, this is something we need to take on board for projects like uh, uh, Mokan Bay Barras that are designed for uh, 120 years design life. And looking at barras and uh, the natural changes. Now, if we don't have any barras and we do nothing to nature, nature will, of course, take its course. Here you can see a uh, grains a view at 2004 that has changed in 2011 and changed again 2014 and changed again in 2018. So this bears the question, is the environment better protected with the barras? These are scenes we see on media on Mocha Bay flooding and defenses being inadequate. And uh, it's very sad to see that again and again and again, sometimes more than once per year, uh, and very costly. And even in 2015, uh, we had this uh, devastating uh, storm Desmond, and you can see uh, the flooding that caused uh, on the Lith Valley in Cambria uh, from uh, the River Kent, very close to uh, Levens Hall. Now, 
whatever we do as engineers, we need to make proposals and take on board the new reality. And COVID-19 and pandemic is something we live today. So the vital conversation is now set across the backdrop of the coronavirus pandemic. So now more than ever, we must prioritize health and well-being of everyone by investing in infrastructure which improves our quality of life. We must put green jobs at the heart of the recovery. We must fix our broken economy so it works for everyone and looks after our planet. Sir David Attenborough have spoken quite a lot about that recently on the British news. We must cooperate globally and act responsibly. The pandemic has disproportionately impacted the poorest and most vulnerable in society. And being one of the richest countries in the world, the UK has a duty to lead the way to protect the health of both people and the planet. At Lancaster University, uh, we continue uh, the, our multidisciplinary research and even more so now uh, linking with uh, environmentalists and environmental scientists. Here in this picture, I'm uh, discussing with Dr. David Howard from the Center of Ecology and Hydrology that uh, he is excellent, an excellent advisor on the environmental aspects. And also I link even with uh, very talented uh, uh, architects from uh, uh, and uh, creating uh, new ideas beyond energy generation. We started this uh, Green Whale project in 2016 and uh, completed in 2017. Uh, and uh, we are looking into tidal barrages beyond energy generation and we are looking to environmental, societal and economical opportunities that might arise. Uh, and uh, this is published and available on the public domain for more technical detail. And we see that this work uh, continues beyond uh, Lancaster and Mokan Bay. We can see, and uh, Mezi. We can see now the proposal by Swansea Bay City Region in 2019 that uh, they created this uh, Dragon Energy Island for Swansea along similar lines. So, uh, with uh, the work that we carry out on multifunctional infrastructure, we can develop international landmarks. Here, this is a click beyond of what we see in Singapore, for instance. Uh, connect communities. Uh, here, we connect uh, uh, on the Mezi the two sides of uh, Liverpool that has even different uh, dimensions. Integrate wildlife and even develop global hydropower research facilities where one of uh, the uh, locations could be reserved for uh, research and uh, research prototypes that uh, can be used both by industry and academia. And again, uh, you can see uh, papers available on the public domain. At Lancaster University, we also look into energy storage technologies, hydropower, compressed air, batteries, flywheel, hydrogen, gravitational mass, and others. Uh, some of them are not uh, uncommon. Here you can see a Japanese version of uh, having a high lake near to the sea 
and the sea as the lower lake as uh, using pump storage. Uh, this is a location in uh, South Lakes that could be used for Morgan Bay in a similar way. Using this as uh, the higher lake uh, natural hole and uh, the sea as the lower lake for a pump storage scheme. And obviously, uh, uh, hydrogen, we carry out research at the moment in Lancaster, and a lot of work is taking place globally on uh, batteries and increasing uh, the size of uh, these schemes. So, from the research point of view, the way I can see uh, our research teams at Lancaster University uh, moving on, and uh, there is quite uh, a large number of uh, researchers that are working on that. Uh, we can see that uh, we need research and modeling uh, to optimize and balance the requirements of climate change, uh, environment and energy generation, energy storage, and grid supply against energy demand, in addition to triple regulation and modeling accuracy go beyond of 0D to 2D and 3D. Also, we need more pumps uh, to successfully maintain the environmental status, sea level rise and mitigate serious flooding. All that is because of the proposed recommendation of the Bennion report of 2019 and its uh, status as a highly protected marine area for Mokan Bay uh, that makes it an unlikely location for the northwest of England to be a power only project. And we really welcome this report because uh, it has helped us to further develop the holistic benefit of uh, Mokan Bay tidal project. And uh, we need to establish links with. Uh, uh, the Eden project, North, it's another Lancaster University project uh, that uh, is progressing. And in 2020, we even have uh, appointed a professor, uh, the first professor for the Eden North project. And just to conclude, this is the vision. And uh, obviously, uh, my vision is for Mokan Bay Tidal Barras uh, to become a vital step in getting us closer to a greener, safer, fair future. And we have seen that tidal energy, unlike wind and solar, does not suffer from intermittency and is unaffected by the weather, is highly predictable for future generations generates day and night and is built for 120 years. So to draw some conclusions, we can see that the primary focus now is health, well-being, green jobs and environment, so climate emergency really. Uh, this is why we need to build a Morgan Bay tidal barrage. Of course, all UK estuaries will be seeing same pressures from rising sea level. So therefore, a barrage across the bay is now essential. And secondary focus now we give to energy, storage, and grid. Obviously, this makes it even more challenging and exciting for us engineers to uh, come up with uh, the solutions. And in 1962, President uh, uh, Kennedy came up with uh, his famous moonshot uh, speech at uh, Rice University. Uh, and uh, he said that we hope to go to the moon, and uh, obviously uh, the words he used reverberate up to today, uh, and uh, uh, his uh, moonshot uh, talk really is uh, equivalent to uh, a difficult challenge that we should tackle. Uh, in, uh, this is back in 62. Uh, now in 2020, in 8th of October, 
we have the earth shot with uh, Prince William and uh, uh, David Anderborough. Perhaps should we go for a Mokam Bay shot? And this is a great challenge, and this is how uh, the research, my research teams at Lancaster University, we are uh, progressing this project at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, so uh, the first question is uh, if you can yeah I'll be happy to answer any questions if you could uh, perhaps Hello, um, I'll pick up uh, questions. I think uh, Murat, who is intending to do it, is maybe having some problems. Um, this is Simon Cathery. I'm uh, secretary of the IMECI Power Industries Division Northwest. Um, so we have had, uh, you know, quite a few questions come in, George. Um, we've got about 10 minutes, I guess, to go through them. So um, okay. I'll just start. Um, <clears throat> I'll just start and pick some. Okay, so the the first question um, that we have is is that you mentioned Lawrence in I think yes. the mid eighties, and the question is what you know what can we learn from uh, from the French experience? Uh, that's an excellent yeah, question. Thank time. you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, it's uh, not mid eighties; it's actually mid sixties, even earlier. This is uh, an excellent project that uh, really uh, started the way and still is showing the way that uh, it has been developed in uh, uh, France and uh, we all go and visit and learn from it uh, and uh, because it has been developed in the 60s uh, uh, we can see uh, the longevity of it uh, and uh, today it's uh, probably the most uh, cost effective plant in uh, the Electricité de France EDF fleet, uh, according to uh, the EDF records. Uh, and uh, obviously the way that it has been designed, uh, it's uh, 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 by the engineers of the 60s, it's still current today. So with uh, projects like that, we do learn a lot. Uh, the machines they have there are still in operation, obviously with uh, the uh, normal engineering maintenance. Uh, and uh, the modes of operation uh, that uh, they developed in the 60s are even current today. So this is a very a good learning process for us because if we are designing a project that is for 120 years duration, we have to develop uh, uh, barras and machines that could cope with uh, uh, 420 years changes of mode of operation. So up to now, we were going for Mokan Bay only mainly for power and obviously the uh, transport link. But now, with the climate emergency, we need to look into a different way and increase pumping. This makes it more challenging for us, the engineers. But obviously, now we know what we have to do. Uh, we can do it. And this is what, what 
uh, research we carry out as we speak at uh, Lancaster University. And it's always assigning, assigning example for us to have uh, uh, projects like Laurent's uh, that uh, it's still operational, is still in use, and is still uh, highly thought of and uh, spoken uh, from uh, its uh, uh, owner uh, in like EDF. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> the next question that I'll bring to you is uh, is about the the ecological impact. Um, so there's there's a couple of questions on that and asking you know how big a challenge is the environmental impact assessment um, complying with regulations about um, uh, prevent preventing impact on protected habitat, habitats and species. So I mean you you have mentioned that and you know, it may be that um, that that you you know the the rising sea levels will have other impacts on the ecology, but certainly you're going to have to um, address those questions, aren't you? So I, I'm sure you've got a uh, for that. Yeah, this is a very good question because uh, uh, up to now uh, we were looking for a power only project and we're looking for uh, maximizing the power generation. Now, uh, the research we carry out at Lancaster is really looking for the environment and the environmental implications and climate change. So really, by building uh, uh, the barriers, we are trying to protect the environment rather than the opposite. So really, uh, using advanced engineering technologies, we will be able to maintain uh, the ecosystem the way it is today, rather than uh, being uh, uh, damaged uh, because of natural causes, as you mentioned, and we have seen the I'm a key report on sea level rises, uh, uh, deal with one meter, uh, but prepare for three meters. All that will change the ecosystem, but by having uh, a barrage there that uh, could act like Noah's Ark, for instance, it could help uh, uh, the cost of, uh, let's say, not only uh, the cost of flooding that you need to put all around the coast on a straight line, but at the same time maintain uh, the uh, environment at uh, its best since it's uh, of uh, such a high environmental importance. And obviously, uh, the way that uh, the modeling of uh, uh, work that of Lancaster University is uh, progressing and has progressed on any projects up to now, we always look into a holistic approach. So we always look into uh, the resource we have available, but and uh, the technology we have available also with environment and all this work takes place from day one with discussions with everybody on board because anything that can affect one area then we have to redress with any other areas. So from uh, the modeling point of view that uh, we are working on, uh, we want to have uh, uh, discussions with uh, uh, all uh, the appropriate uh, environmental agencies uh, right from day one so we can ensure that we can engineer solutions that will maintain this environment and at the same time uh, protect from uh, future environmental disasters because of uh, climate change. Really then the barrage becomes a protective wall for what is existing today rather than damaging of what is existing today that could be damaged as we have seen if we don't do anything. This is why it's so important now more than before to actually do something and progress with uh, a project like uh, Mogan Bay Tidal Barrage. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. That's that's very interesting um, response. 
Um, <clears throat> we're close to the end of time, so I'll just cover one more question, which I think is, you know, a more pragmatic engineering question for the the, the, the power, you know, the power aspects of the project. Um, and I, I don't think you did cover it explicitly, but can you give a quick indication of the the power that the Morecambe Bay um, barrage could produce? Um, how much you know potential there is in the UK overall for um, for power from this tidal energy, um, and uh, you know what the how the cost per megawatt um, for that compares to other forms of renewable energy. Well, uh, there is uh, specifics and details are available on the public domain, and uh, I showed you a page from uh, BHA uh, Tidal Alliance, uh, Tidal uh, Range Alliance, that they give uh, specific numbers. I'll focus on Mokan Bay uh, just to give you some specific answers here. Uh, but if we had more time, I can go beyond and I can go internationally as well. Now, uh, for Morgan Bay, uh, depending on where we draw the line, and at Lancaster University, uh, uh, we have looked at plants that we could generate up to four gigawatts. Just uh, to uh, make it uh, uh, more understandable what I mean with four gigawatts, if uh, one uh, nuclear power station, for instance, is, I think, in uh, the UK, our largest and newest one is uh, size well B, which is 1.2. And if we say, on average, 1.2 gigawatts. Uh, uh, so if we say one gigawatt is one nuclear power station, uh, we are talking about the equivalent of four nuclear power stations. Uh, mm -hmm. Just, uh, just to, to put it in uh, context uh, that uh, we can uh, appreciate and understand. So we are talking about a lot of energy. But on top of that, we are looking into uh, uh, not just power. We are link looking into pumping. We are looking into preventing flooding, preventing uh, sea level rises, uh, and uh, protect the environment. And uh, by coming up with clever design ideas, we can actually uh, even increase that because some of uh, the lessons we learned, this time not from Laurence, but uh, from uh, the Annapolis project in the Bay of Fundi, whenever you see uh, a picture of, in operation of this project, you will see a very large wake uh, for miles going away. One idea that uh, we are uh, following here at uh, Lancaster University is uh, to actually damage this uh, turbulence past the turbines by introducing tidal current turbines uh, outside of uh, the barrage, which means that the power then could increase further on the outside of uh, uh, the barrage, but at the same time can uh, uh, damage all the turbulence we see that is happening at. Uh, 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 the Bay of Fudia, the Annapolis project. So, uh, depending on how we draw the line and the plan we make for the project, we can come up with more specific uh, numbers, I guess, on that. But it is a significant amount of power. So, in yeah, Lancaster, no, we have, uh, in Lancaster, for instance, we have uh, uh, two nuclear power stations, uh, HSM1 and HSM2. This is equivalent to four nuclear power stations. And obviously, uh, 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 as we say, uh, if uh, a nuclear power station has a design life of 30 and then we can extend it further by so many years, uh, for this project, uh, we're talking about uh, 120 years. And uh, obviously, uh, completely predict predictable. Uh, and uh, free resource because it's uh, as long as uh, the Earth, uh, the Moon, and the Sun are in orbit, uh, we will have that tide, and we can predict it for yesterday to tomorrow, and 
thousands of years to come. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that, George. Um, I think we uh, probably need to wrap up now. We're we're five minutes over time, um, and we we will wrap up. I think it's been um, an excellent uh, and very very thought provoking presentation. Um, I know that we've you know we've we've got a lot of people on online over 100 people online so that's um that's positive and we've had some uh we've had you know a number of, of of questions um just to reconfirm the arrangements for those um the the questions that we haven't been able to um you know to get to here um the emma pateman at, at the omeki will collate those and, and pass them on to professor agidis and uh, hopefully when he gets time he'll he, he will provide responses um though due to gdpr regulations those have to go through um the imeki um but professor agidis his um contact details is his email address is here on the slide so if you do want to contact him he, he's happy to receive um direct contact uh, he has said the um the the slide the presentation has been recorded and um the recording will be made available to to attendees um in 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 due course and uh, i believe will be um, made available on the imeki website um as well um so it just remains for me on on behalf of the um I'm a key power industries division Northwest uh, Centre to um, thank um, Dr. Edgidis for, for an excellent presentation um, and um, to thank the, uh, the facilitation of Emma Bateman and Fiona Wong at, um, at I'm a key headquarters and uh, my colleagues on the, um, on the, on the committee, David Ball Murat, um, Islam and, and Georgina Harris. Um, there are here um some links to uh to to other ways of finding further events um if you go onto the imeki website um in the events page um then you know there are lots of uh, lots of interesting things and hopefully we're all finding them easier to attend now as they're uh, available online okay so i'll wrap up now and um we'll finish the uh, presentation. Thank you, Dr. Agidis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending.